today's guests are Penelope Canaan and Ross Hinkle. We join their conversation in the Faculty Lab. Global climate change is rising sea level. Right. How are we going to adapt to that? That's a sociological, economic, and environmental right. problem. Well, and I've, I've seen the maps of uh, Florida's landscape. Should there be, should both of the major catastrophes that we're worried about, the Larson B ice shelf mm -hmm. and the uh, Greenland mm -hmm. uh, melting, um, how much water there will be in Florida mm -hmm. on its coast. Yeah. And, uh, doesn't look good for Miami, does it? <laughs> no, it doesn't look good for mo many of the coastal areas. Yeah. But you know, there's there's such a debate about about global climate change, and and I you know I'm not a, a global climate change uh, scientist from the modeling perspective. Mm -hmm. I'm more from looking at uh, the potential impacts and how ecosystems will respond. But what what's kind of unfortunate sometimes, and and is that um, Science is, is uh, debated in the public by the media, and it puts a different perspective on it. And what we have to do is to try to maintain the, the scientific rigor of understanding just what's happening and try to implement that uh, into the, some of the discussion and, and so forth. And, and uh, that demands sociological as well as ecological and environmental input. Right. Yeah. But I, and I think that science for so long has been used to not being part of the, of the conversation mm -hmm. in public mm -hmm. and now has been pretty frustrated and has kind of crossed a line mm -hmm. to be trying to get science, you know, it's kind of like if you could say, hey, I know the Great Depression is about to happen, is going <laughs> to happen. Now, right. if you knew that, w I mean, how much would you want to keep it at the university, or how much would you right. be out there trying to talk about it? So, mm -hmm. I think science has has done a, has crossed that line, but also has been fairly careful about it, and is kind of frustrated by the lack of r social response. Well, I think you're exactly right, and and um, I, I, the the issue is integrating the science into the debate in a meaningful way. Uh, and and uh, also having scientific li literate or public <laughs> public and <laughs> journalists and, and journalists yes right. Mm -hmm. right and I find journalists are often trying to push me to make it a black and white thing rather than the complex phenomenon that it is mm -hmm. and and trying to get the kind of well you know the the conflict two sides of an issue as if there are really only two sides or that there the the two extremes are what's interesting to the journalist. You know mm -hmm. what I mean to try and exactly get a headlines. Yes, exactly headlines. Well, and and that's an Im it's important and to do that in order to get the public engaged. Right, the hook. But the, the hook, but uh, the meat right. <laughs> it needs to also be integrated right. in. Right, right. Yeah, and what are uh, how are sociologists approaching the the uh, the climate change issue? What are some things that you folks are doing that well, I would say that there, are, that primarily sociologists are interested in the, in the stratification effects of the impacts. That is, that the there will be environmental refugees, that the poor, um, the the poor will be less resilient to in their adaptation. Um, Didn't we see that in Katrina? Exactly. Yeah, we've had we've right. had a preview. Right, exactly. Wow. It's and we have a, a national task force of of sociologists that are studying the Katrina various things about Katrina, including the uh, plight of the first responders. Mm -hmm. I mean, the first responders in the Katrina uh, situation were also victims. You mm -hmm. know, of, I mean, how were they going to be responding if they had no? No office, no telephone, no you know, no right. no tools of response, mm -hmm. and how they were also worried about their own families. And uh, yeah. you know, at one point, I remember one anecdote that one of the responders uh, was told, 
you are the Red Cross now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you are it. Mm -hmm. And he was all alone, and he had to make these field decisions. And so there's uh, some research on the different roles that were played, and certainly Katrina also interests sociology as an example of the, the um, conf not conflict, but the interaction between federal, state, and local government, or mm -hmm. shall I say the lack of mm -hmm. communication in some, or what, what were the nuances or uh, types of communication, and how we do a lot of community disaster research, mm -hmm. and how do communities, how, how are they organized and built, how mm -hmm. the built environment will also um, influence um, responses in natural disasters. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Um, prior to coming to UCF, I was with a private company at uh, Kennedy Space Center, and uh, one of the contracts that we had was to support the Environmental Protection Agency in looking at the situation in Katrina to deal with issues of hazardous materials. Just think, every house has hazardous materials. Of course. And houses were destroyed, and materials were dispersed right. through the environment. And one of the things that, that, the reason I'm telling the story is one of the things that, that just uh, caught my attention is that we talked to one of our scientists in the field and about how it was going, you know, and it was rough living, and it would seen a lot of impact of salt water intruding into freshwater marshes, of uh, trees that were hundreds of years old blown over and, and uh, total ecosystem changes. And at the time that he was there, he said, well, the thing that just really disturbs me is I don't see any birds. Uh, you know, I, I don't hear the birds and I don't, and I, you know, I don't know uh, what was scientifically behind that, but that impression is what, what caught my attention. Right, uh, the so sounds. Right, the sounds right. are so different. Right, <laughs> but you're also talking about there was no livelihood for a lot of people, right? Right. Yes, exactly. Yeah, it's, it, um, so many. That, that would interest a sociologist, is mm -hmm. the economy, the, how the economy was changing, how the schools were changed, you know, all of the different components of of a community, mm -hmm. how those were all devastated and mm -hmm. and individually devastated and and as a system devastated. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that intrigues me and, and in a way concerns me is that let's let's assume that the predictions are correct. Mm -hmm. the The level of effect and the level of change is is debatable. That's right. The change the to me is always uncertain. <laughs> the, to me, the change is not debatable. It's right. it's happening as as we see it and the the. Um, is that we have large populations that are living in areas that are either going to have to be shored up, protected, or moved, such as large populations moved out of the area of Katrina. Well, we, uh, we have a limited amount of, uh, quote, uh, natural resources and space that have been preserved as conservation areas, as right, parks, right. as green spaces, and so forth. Um, what happens when we start debating uh, utilizing those areas right. to relocate people? Are are looking and, at and that's relocating within our borders. Yeah, and what yeah. W many of the coastal zones around the world are in very poor countries. Mm -hmm. I mean, think of the uh, Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's uh, it's flooded uh, frequently, and there there's uh, tens of thousands of people. And uh, uh, the predictions are millions of environmental refugees under mm -hmm. many of the scenarios. Mm -hmm. which yeah. So where did they go? <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah. Um, well, um, science is going to help understand the the effects of global climate change, and it's going technology and science are going to help develop ways to deal with it. But it is it is happening and will happen. So. I think we have to, uh, I like to take a conservative approach and, and take a worst case scenario when it comes to an issue as important as that, right. is, to, is to try to develop programmatically and to focus research and look at what can be done, particularly in the areas of biology and conservation biology. What can we do to help in understanding and also help in providing information that can where we make smart decisions rather than 
emotional decisions. Right. Yeah. And, and make them in a timely fashion. In a timely fashion, uh, There's yes. something now called the 2% solution. Have you been following this? Uh, no, I'm, I'd like to hear yeah, about it. It's, a, <laughs> it's saying that if we want to stabilize emissions at, I think it's uh, 550 by 2050, then we're needing to, we need to be reducing CO2 emissions by 2% per year. Mm -hmm. So that's the 2% solution. And, and also oh, I see. saying, mm -hmm. t in other words, it's an incremental but rolling um, improvement, if you will, in our carbonization. Mm -hmm. And that's a conservative or and that's a conservative uh, response, but it's a measured mm -hmm. um, pathway. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're, I think, most of the, uh, I should say, political or NGOs that, um, are now glomming on to this notion of a 2% solution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And well, how, uh, um, how do you think the public that now perceives global climate change? Is it, is it widespread or is it still, are there still doubts? Or? Well, it's funny. It got so polarized. Uh, mm. And I think that was helped by the uh, current administration mm. trying to say that the science wasn't at, was still out for so long, mm -hmm. and um, so I think most people believe that it's happening, don't know that it's, they don't believe it's as severe a problem, because mm -hmm. it's not, it's, mm -hmm. we used to talk about by the end of the century. Yes. It's now, fa it's now, now it's faster. Now 2050. Right, 2050. <laughs> the mid, a, mid century. Right, and, w and even 2050 sounds far away to some young people, mm -hmm. and, but to you and I, to you and me, we know that It'll be 2050 before mm -hmm. a lot of people know it. Um, but some people think either it's so bad that we might as well just go out and have a beer, <laughs> <laughs> or it's so bad that somebody must be doing something about it, mm -hmm. or it's, it's not so bad because nobody's doing anything about it, mm -hmm. or those, I think, but the, I think it's, there's a tipping point in public perception and, and action, and I think we've hit it. Mm -hmm. I think that people are now s seriously, there's a lot of segments of society that are seriously interested in, in mm -hmm. doing, in preparing and adaptation, mitigation measures, mm -hmm. and some serious attention. Yeah. I also think, just one second, I think yeah. um, I grew up and was in graduate school during the energy crisis. Right. And that, that whole thing influenced who I became academically mm -hmm. and my in my mm -hmm. career. And I think there are a lot of people my age mm -hmm. that are, have been working in t related areas that are now of an age that we can, that we have some wisdom, we, some, some experience, and all of finding each other to really make this decade the most exciting mm -hmm. decade. Right. All right. Well, I was in graduate school during the, the 70s, mid-70s, and the National Environmental Protection Act came about. Right, me too. The Threatened and Endangered Species right. Act. And of course, uh, uh, I was in an ecological program, ecology, at, the, univer that? at the University of Tennessee, uh -huh. and I uh, did a master's and PhD there. And um, at the time, um, there was a prolifer proliferation of environmental consulting companies. This right. is how I started my career, with dealing with environmental impacts. Me too. And it so it really shaped, it really shaped my career. Um, but uh, I, I tell you a little story about, uh, uh, this a simple thing can sometimes impress you a lot. I, I spent the last few years, well, 10 years plus, working with a colleague from the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center uh, on a project funded by the Department of Energy to look at the effects of double ambient atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration. What's on, double ambient It's mean? twice the concentration. So you take ambient, which is approximately 350 parts per million right. concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Today. Today. Mm -hmm. And uh, you double that to 700 and you look at how ecosystems respond. And we had an extensive... So you, you're putting some kind of an envelope over an ecosystem yes, and measuring it? putting little chambers. Uh -huh, so you're pumping in pumping CO2. Pumping in CO2. Measured to, amount. Measured, doubling 
the uh, concentration, and then looking at things like water utilization, biomass production, insect grazing, right, right. respiration, uh, the physiological processes, uh, species competition, um, a whole series of, of questions can be answered in that experimental design. But um, we were studying at ambient to 350 parts per million. Well, I have a colleague that probably 25 years, 30 years prior to those, our study, was doing field work and he was using for ambient concentration of carbon dioxide something like he was measuring 290 parts per million. So, you know, thinking about that, it, you know, that's well, now a... Let me get this straight. 290 is what we was normal for hundreds of thousands of years, right? Uh, well, that, that that was what was normal when, when he was doing his study. Okay. Uh, that was his background measurement, around 300, something okay. like that. And then we were doing a study, and our background was 350 parts per million. And we were trying to estimate what would happen if it were 700 right. parts per million. So it's um, just thinking about the fact that you know, a colleague in my lifetime was studying it. Exactly. Um, at, at that level, and we were studying it at this increased level, anticipating it doubling. Um, so the problem is very real to me. Well, and so <laughs> what, what, what was the response, for the ecosystem response? Well, oh, it's very complex. Um, uh, I can k just mention some for, uh, just in generalities. For example, uh, there were three dominant oak species in our experimental design they responded differently. And you would think, well, no, they're oak they're species. Oaks. Mm -hmm. Two of them responded one way and another one responded in terms of their water utilization and also in terms of the develop, uh, production of biomass, primary production. Um, and how much time did you give this experiment? Well, the experiment uh, started in um, 1994 and we finished it up this year and so it was a little over 10 years. So a 10 year growth. Yes, uh -huh. a 10 year response, which was one of the longest running studies. And uh, as a matter of fact, um, there was another study up in, uh, at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center in Edgewater, Maryland, in wetland systems. Mm -hmm. So uh, the principal investigator, a Dr. Bert Drake, who's a longtime colleague, was doing was doing that study there, and also looking at a tropical or subtropical mm -hmm. system. Was uh, that part of that series of LTER? Well, we were not part of an LTER, long-term ecological research right. site. No, we were not part of an LTER. This was funding. This was a project funded DOE. by the Department of Energy, which is interested in the impacts of uh, rising levels of carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, but the, uh, do LTERs put people in the equation? That's a good question. I um, I think uh, from the perspective of looking at ecosystems, uh, they probably look at the historical impact mm -hmm. of humans on the site. Mm -hmm. um, there is a new program with the National Science Foundation that's under development called the National Ecological Observatory Network. Have you heard about that? NEON. NEON, no, right. I haven't, I, I, uh, I really saw it only on something that I looked up about you. Oh, okay. <laughs> so yeah. tell me more. Well, the, um, just to backtrack a little bit, probably one of the largest ecological studies was done back in the 60s and 70s. It was called the um, the International Biological Program. And what stimulated that was concern about what would happen to radionuclides that would get into the environment. And, and I have to be honest with you, I think that that probably pushed ecological sciences into the realm of experimental science. Mm -hmm. And uh, was a was a this major was program. Wor worry under the Cold War of yes. nuclear attack. Right. Okay. Cesium is similar to calcium in the environment. So, where calcium goes, cesium goes. Uh -huh. uh, just uh, simply put it. But anyway, there has not been another major ecological uh, effort. Uh, 
similar to what NEON is going to do. And basically, it's in 20 different sections, climatic sections of the country called domains. They're going to set up a series of sites that monitor abiotic and biotic activity, species diversity, uh, population dynamics, weather, climate, soil, just a whole range of parameters that will allow one to really understand ecosystem processes and, and uh, in, uh, response of ecosystems to environmental change. Okay, this now. is going to be a very long-term study. But now we, you can't find 20, you said, right? There are 20 uh, domains. domains, right. Mm -hmm. You couldn't find 20 domains without human beings in them, could you? Oh, so no, and, so and humans are a part of this. Okay, That's so the point. are there social scientists part of this NEON program? Yes, I, it, it includes uh, uh, the land use, land uh, cover. cover history, and utilization. It includes ecological processes. It includes uh, di population dynamics of humans as well as as uh, natural or other species. It still, it still sounds very ecosystem and not very sociological. It's a good point. There's no culture, there's no institutions, you know, so. Right. Oh, so that's, that's a very interesting right. point. Yeah. How would you integrate that into? That'd be interesting. Well, let me back up. First of all, I want to say, what is NEON again? National Ecological Observatory Network. So it's kind of like LTER, only with 20 of them. It, and it's, it's, it's designed to answer what they call grand challenge questions about the environmental change and to try and build uh, a data and uh, scientific thought processes that allow us to do things like ecological forecasting, ecological risk assessments, and a grand scale, and to deal with questions that, that could impact L major uh, across biome or across right, right, ecosystem. Right. Well, so what what we would also, I mean, we know that you're anticipating ecosystem response. So you also need, we also need to anticipate social response. Mm -hmm. In the so what I would make sure is that I had, as I was saying, the, this poetic. I would think of each of those biomes as the poetics of place or the poetics of biome. Hmm. And so I would say what is the, uh, this is from the human side, the population composition, of mm -hmm. composition, distribution, uh, and uh, change within those. The, uh, the way societies are organized mm -hmm. within each one, the, the ecosystem type, and the, um, that by that I mean physical ecosystem type, not Mm -hmm. not social ecosystem, Te the technologies that are used for transportation, mm -hmm. for um, almost industrial processes and, and mm -hmm. economic processes, technology, and um, that's the technology, institutional arrangements, what, how, are, how is the economy, the polity, the, um, the health systems, all of those organized, mm -hmm. and the um, culture, so that's the poetics, mm -hmm. population, organization, environment, technology, institutions, and culture. Oh, wow. I would want to know, I mean, th how, how the Hispanic culture and its, its, um, its embracing of family and of religion, mm. for example, is, and its relationship to the land is mm -hmm. much different than, um, let's say, the, uh, the farmers in the Midwest, mm -hmm. very different orientation. Mm -hmm. Than the, than, the, than the Pacific Northwest and their kind of um, forestry management mm -hmm. is different than the, than the farmers in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. So each of those n deserves kind of a, uh, an appreciation of culture and institutions. I think mm -hmm. that's the biggest mm -hmm. part I would add. Yeah. And of course, the history of the area, the yeah. history, the land use yeah. history. And right. It certainly impacts what it, what we see today. What is the mi migration patterns, for example? Mm -hmm. And so I think that there's a, uh, I mean, there are IGERT grants from NSF. We need to talk about yeah, that, right? Yeah, we should do yeah, that together. Yeah, right. Yeah. That's a inter. Uh, what is that? Interdisciplinary graduate education research and training. I'm right. Right. Make it up, but I think mm -hmm. that's it. Yeah. It's hard though to figure out what are the standards they're using to to award those, mm -hmm. but I believe that UCF is 
ready, is poised, mm -hmm. if we would put it together. Um, some people were working on that centers of excellence. Mm -hmm. Are you working on a proposal for that? We, we, were, uh, we were preparing, we did a pre-proposal yeah. for that. And uh, uh, the, some aspects of the proposal were, uh, did not really show the job creation that is, was anticipated. Yeah, yeah, um, right. But the, the proposal we put together was a very integrated proposal to look at human health and environmental health aspects. And, and uh, I, I